uh, go talk to them out in the foyer during the break, which is going to be happening right after the next keynote talk, which is uh, from Aisha, who is from Slim AI. She's going to be talking to us about all of the things that she discovered when they ripped the covers off of lots of public containers. Yes. So let's make sure that we set this up properly. Wow, it's bright. Hey guys, hello DC. Let's put this up on the screen the other way. Gosh, I broke the system just by <laughs> moving it around. Okay, now it's back. How do I? I'm an engineer by training. <laughs> I just can't find the, um, the mouse. Seriously. Almost there. Let's go into presentation mode. And there we go. Can you hear me? That was the talk. So the cameraman, perfect. So. I was debating about this, like whether to tell the story or not, but here we go. So I was coming here this morning, I saw a cameraman and somebody with a microphone in their hand. They were doing street interviews with random strangers. And I literally started running away from the scene, making no eye contact whatsoever. So the reason is, a couple months ago, I was in Austin, uh, I, was in other, I was at this other conference, uh, OSS Summit, and on the street I got cornered by a similar crew. They were doing street interviews and they wanted to ask me a couple questions and I said, yes, they were so sweet. So they started asking me about my job, what company I work for, I told them that I'm a data scientist, I work for this company called Slim.ai startup. And they went on, they asked questions about how many hours I work on in a week, uh, and the good, the bad, and the ugly of the profession. And I answered them, it was a short video that they recorded, and I forgot about that. So, 10 days ago, I learned that that video went viral. On something called YouTube Shorts that I didn't know existed, I'm such a boomer, and I started getting all these connection requests on LinkedIn, on Twitter. People uh, were asking me career advice. Uh, they were asking me about data science in general. I was getting very existential, very philosophical questions at times. See, yesterday I got this question. Somebody said, Aisha, is data science real science? And I responded, of course not. See, one of my professors at MIT used to say, any field that has science in the name is not true science. <laughs> think, think neuroscience, decision science, right? computer science, data science. We never see anyone talking about physics science or chemistry science. right? Maybe that's because there's nothing that they need to compensate for. <laughs> but with data science, like you know, whether it is a true science or not, I think the insights that I'm going to share with you today will be significant. And um, you know, see, I'm not a DevOps engineer. But as a data scientist, I think I can open a window into the world of containers as developers experience them often for the first time. So with that, let's start talking about what we learned dissecting the world's most popular connect, uh, con containers at Slim.ai. But before I do that, I would like to give you a quick intro about why we do what we do at Slim. I would like to talk a little bit about the container landscape, look at the growth through a lens of opportunities and challenges, 
then we can go into the insights and talk about the details. But I would like to wrap it up talking about the future and how we can improve the status quo as an industry. Sound good? Let's go. So spoiler alert, the world that we will be talking about is a complex and complicated landscape. And it is not getting any simpler. I see that in the data as I analyze it every day. And it is not, again, going to get any simpler, especially if we don't interfere. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you heard about Docker Slim or Slim AI and or? Wow, nice. There are a few people. I see Brandon, <laughs> one of our advisors at Slim AI. So Docker Slim is our open source container optimization tool. It's a very well-known GitHub project. Lots of people, a lot of teams around the globe have integrated it into their CI CD pipelines. And with Slim AI, our SaaS portal, we use that core technology, that strong foundation, and make it more layered, richer, more efficient, faster. At Slim AI, data is our central nervous system. And I get to be the person who leads the analytical efforts, which, you know, as you can see from my face, I feel very lucky about, uh, very joyful about, because we get to analyze thousands, hundreds of thousands of containers on our platform on a daily basis. It's a data scientist's dream coming true. One more thing, maybe a little bit about myself. Um, I did my grad work focusing on technological forecasting, mathematical optimization, and I focused a lot on the physical supply chain part of the world. Then in my career, I spent a ton of time on the cybersecurity world. And as 2022, we started talking more about software supply chain and cybersecurity. That gives me a wide angle, especially working with this type of data, I'm hoping. So let's talk about this landscape, the containers. And I'm, you know, especially for people that are in this room, when I say containers are mainstream, you'll be like, yes, it's yesterday's news, right? Some of you will remember the CNCF survey from 2020 which showed an undeniable increase across all of these fields, development, test, production, in terms of container adoption. Especially that far right bar chart that's showing a 20 to, you know, an increase from a 23% to 84% in terms of container adoption. Oh, you weren't hearing me when I was turning my head this way, right? Sorry about that. So it basically showed in production that Companies are using containers, they are putting their trust in containers from you know, 2016 to 2019. And the only area that seemed to be declining down is POC, which basically said containers are no longer an idea. Fast forward to 2022, one of my favorite moments in the year is that time when Stack Overflow publishes their developer survey, and this year, these two charts, especially, uh, really, well, I, know I found them both mind-blowing, especially in relationship to each other. The first one said Docker is the number one most loved technology by developers. I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of developer friends, and they complain, huff and puff about Docker all the time, but I also know that they have a love and hate relationship with many other technological tools that they are using. So I can get that part. The second part said, Docker is the number one most wanted tool developers wanted to learn in their, uh, in, in their tool, uh, wanted to add to their tool kit. And that basically explains the influx of fresh blood into the ecosystem. A lot of developers are learning about containers, climbing the learning curve, and it might also mean that as they climb up that curve, there might be some issues in terms of understanding 
um, you know, in terms of clarity um, and, and, and lack of expertise. So speaking of Docker, the world's largest repo of, uh, of images, right? Um, they said between 2020 and 2021, the number of all times pool, the all time pools have tripled, nearly tripled from 130 billion to 318 billion. So think about how long it took to get to that 130 billion. Six years. And as a data scientist, I don't use keywords like exponential or geometric when I talk about growth. But I think it is safe to say that the momentum has shifted. It has increased significantly. And I don't see a slowdown anytime soon. While it's great that these atomic units of shipping, building and shipping code is giving us a lot of agility, speed and efficiency in our CI CD pipelines, of all the people, the people in this room will tell me that container management is not easy. In fact, I heard DevOps professionals talking about how we are in the stone ages of container management, how the growth might have outpaced our capacity to understand, to manage containers by an order of magnitude. And I see that in companies that we work for, with, in startups and large companies, but I also see that in the data that we analyze. See, as at Slim, we look into these scans of containers all the time, right? My team and I, we design these statistical um, research studies and we look into the containers, we basically uh, deconstruct them and try to understand what makes them developer friendly and what makes them production ready. So for this study that I would like to talk about today, um, it's, it's going to be about 130 public containers available on Docker Hub, the most popular ones that we choose again for the sake of this study. And for those data nerds or the people who want to understand the mechanics, I wanted to go into the methodology a little bit, but it's going to be quick. So selection, how did we select them? We looked into measures like pool counts and likes. We looked into, we observed our own platform, how many things are being scanned, how many unique images are being scanned on a given day, the most popular ones among them. We, um, wanted to add a layer of qualitative analysis, so we talked to a lot of container experts and enthusiasts. We also looked at things like Docker image status and whatnot. You might question the sample size. I was just talking about how Docker houses millions of images, nine and a half million to be exact. So 130 may sound like a handful. But when you look into the pool counts of these containers as a group, I'm talking about more than 25%, almost 30% of all the pool counts in Docker. So this is more than 100 billion of pools that these containers represent. Among them, there are certain containers that has been pooled five, six, seven billion times. So it is a very strong sample. Then, after we selected these containers, we created them into different groups to understand the in-group, out-group dynamics between these containers. So we um, created, we looked into categories like general purpose funds, so think web development, data science containers, programming languages. We also created spatial purpose ones, like infrastructure, like DevOps and local. And um, the, in terms of the process, what we did was we wanted to model a real world scenario. So we um, basically mocked a CI CD systems system and we said, like, here is a developer coming up and picking one of these containers. We scanned these containers using standard open source tools. I listed a couple here. So we used X-Ray from our Docker Slim tool. We used um, 
SBOM and vulnerable T's uh, analysis tools like the ones from Encore, Sift and um, Gripe to be specific here. Those are great tools. I love all of them, honestly. And in terms of the, um, the questions that we were trying to answer, we wanted to understand if these containers will be easy to use. Are they going to be efficient and safe? And more importantly, will they cause any issues when we ship our applications to production? So what we learned. We have very limited time today, so I just brought a couple highlights here. The first one was about how bloated containers might be a time sink for your CI CD systems. So this chart here is showing the relationship between the sizes of these containers and how long it took to scan them. And you can see that there is almost, for the sample size, there is almost a perfect correlation. So for every 500 megabits added into the system, we were seeing 50 seconds longer scans. And if it is a single container being shipped by a developer every now and then, it might be trivial. But we know that scale changes everything. See, I, you know, if I ask you to get me a pint of ice cream from the supermarket next door, that's one thing. If I ask you to get me 20 million of them by next Tuesday, without letting any one of it melt, that's a different problem, right? So if you're talking about a medium-sized business, maybe 100 developers shipping to production multiple times a day, working with thousands of containers, these things do add up. The second learning was one of complexity. And there's a lot to unpack here. I can talk about this section forever, but I won't. So this was mostly about looking into different components in these containers and trying to wrap our heads around it. So I brought in three box plot uh, graphs here for spatial permissions, licenses, and packages. Let's focus on one of them, the packages here. So what you're seeing here is a box plot chart where for every category from programming languages to uh, DevOps to web development tools. You're looking into the median number of packages as well as the lower and upper quartiles and you're seeing the outliers. These were charts that I literally couldn't believe my eyes. Like, you know, I was just sitting in, my, in front of my computer looking at my screen with a blank facial expression because I was expecting, you know, although I was expecting these outliers, I wasn't expecting the averages to be this large. So take, for example, data science there, or maybe programming languages, right? You know, it is, you know, we can see those containers that has more than a thousand packages in them, but even the averages are, were like, you know, 300, 400, 500 packages. And we haven't even spoken about the long tail, the supply chain effects of these uh, components in these containers. See, you might also remember the study from uh, Darmstadt University back in 2019, where they were looking into a subset. They were looking into the NPM ecosystem. And they said the package reach of the top five packages in this ecosystem were more than 100,000 dependencies each. See, a container having five of these packages, just making things up, right, might have 500,000 dependencies. So I was expecting to work more on this side. So those five packages, six packages, ten packages. But as I was looking at the averages in these containers, I realized that the tip of the iceberg was the iceberg, was an iceberg. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that these packages should not be included in, the, included in these containers and that the developers should be starting with bare metal and whatnot. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. In fact, I actually want them to get 
that experimental, playful experience come in. These are like the fact that these packages, these all these things are in there in these containers make it really easy to start with. But I'm concerned that if we are not making a conscious effort to remove these redundancies from these containers, we are risking technical debt downstream. We are incurring that debt. Uh, we need to be very mindful about what we do as we uh, push these into production. And building on that category, we also looked into the vulnerabilities in these packages, in these libraries. And again, you will tell me that attack surface is not a function of vulnerabilities alone. I agree. It is the severity of these vulnerabilities. It is these spatial permissions, these packages in these containers, these zero-day uh, opportunities for attackers, the user being the root and whatnot. But even those sheer counts were really high. I have seen containers with 1,000, 105, you know, 1,500, 2,000 vulnerabilities several times in this study. But what really surprised me was not that. It was the distribution of the severity of these vulnerabilities. See, I was expecting, as I have spent a lot of time in the cybersecurity industry, I was expecting maybe 5%, but you know, less than 5% of these vulnerabilities belonging into a high or critical category. It turned out that in every category, almost every category, except maybe base OS, the percent of vulnerabilities belonging to a high or critical category was more than 20%. And even like, you know, in some spatial purpose cases, right, DevOps in local development, I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, that, that percentages were even higher, which might be a blind spot for our developer and DevOps, DevSecOps teams. So what's next? This was the first step in our in-depth container research. What we found was a vast and varied and complex landscape that gives developers massive opportunities to scale but it also presents significant risks, as you can see. As we do deeper research and understand this landscape more, we will be able to answer deeper questions. We will be able to look into the supply chain ecosystem and the rippling effects on our eco technological ecosystem much better. But in the end game, ultimately, what do we want? We want our developers to have the best experience possible. We don't want them to feel like they are running an unending marathon all the time, trying to wrap their heads around all of these complexities. We want them to have fun you know, in these experimental, playful environments, but we also want to ship production-ready containers. We want our systems to be as error-free as vulnerability and risk-free as possible. I mean, if we learned anything from studying complex systems over the decades using systems dynamics analysis, for example, we know that complex systems are inherently riskier. And as you can see, as an industry, we haven't spent enough time for, to do intelligent simplification optimization. I think automating these systems and introducing uh, intelligent container optimization into the system is the best way to go. And I know that there are a lot of teams, my team at Slim AI, other companies in the industry, they are losing their sleep over this problem. And when we put our minds together, we do great things. So I'm hopeful about the future. I might not have sounded that way. I know that the future is bright. And hopefully, when I speak to you next time, I'll be bringing better news. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Let's connect on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I promise that I'm not going to provide any data science career advice. 
Um, but I would love to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for having me, guys.